Amy and I enjoyed our usual family dinner at the kitchen table. Our children have already moved away, so it's just the two of us. I quickly made a simple vegetarian roast since Amy was late from work. Amy usually comes home before me, but not today. It was important for us to have a family dinner together, not only for ourselves, but also to spend time with the children. I was just pouring myself another cup of coffee when my 51-year-old wife mentioned something that I didn't immediately catch. My mind was on a work issue, so I wasn't fully focused on her. What she said didn't make sense, and I must have misheard her. She stared at me intently, waiting for an answer. I asked, confused. I don't understand. What are you doing? Amy studied my face with an unusual expression before babbling, I've been dating Cody. The new physical education teacher at our school is Cody Bakersfield. I know you know him, I said, trying to figure out the situation. Suddenly, I felt a strange feeling in my stomach. So, you're dating him. What does this mean? Amy took a deep breath and confessed. We've become friends, Cliff. I had lunch with him, and after school we... I mean, I've met him. Are you dating him? I laughed. Oh my god, Amy! What are you telling me? Are you having an affair? I expected her to deny it, but instead she looked into my eyes and said, Yes, yes. I grunted in disbelief and asked, Yes, what? Are you having an affair? She confirmed, Yes, Cliff, it's true. I was confused. Please just listen, Cliff. I know it's shocking, but it's not like that. It's not bad, dear. Are you serious? I couldn't believe it. I had to talk to you about Cody because you are very dear to me, and she always did. Do you respect me? Do you love me? I was shocked. How is this possible? Yes, it's true. She cut me off. You've always been the most important person to me. Marrying you was the best decision of my life. I love you and I will never let you go. I love you more than anything in the world. I couldn't help but tell you about him. I kept my eyes on her face, hoping desperately that this was all just a prank or something. Amy loves me as much as I love her. She can't be having an affair. But when she didn't take it back, I tried to make sense of it all. I do not know what to say, Amy. I'm so confused. Please don't get upset, Cliff, she begged. Yes, I spend time with Cody, but he's just a friend, and I don't have feelings for him. Think about it, dear. Despite the fact that we are together, our love and relationship remain unchanged. I gritted my teeth, shocked by the unexpected turn of events. How can you say that you love me? I really love you, she insisted sincerely. We have a strong marriage, which I cherish, but I need other male friends. I've never been against you having male friends. In response, she said, I know, and I'm grateful to you for that. Cody is just a friend to me. I always like being with you, but being with Cody is something else entirely. He is much younger than us, and looks at things like this in a different way. I want to admit that sometimes he makes me feel young again. I haven't felt like this in a long time. Stop! I burst into tears. I tried my best to stay calm, but my composure was failing me. I had to interrupt her romantic fairy tale. Please don't tell me about your dirty affair. I don't want to hear about your feelings for him or what you and this guy are doing behind my back. Amy noticed my anger and spoke carefully. I'm really sorry, honey. I understand that this is a sensitive topic right now, but I have to be honest with you. Please don't hate me for this. Yes, I'm dating Cody, but we've been very careful about this. No one else knows and we've taken care of it. I'm sure you never suspected anything, and neither did anyone else. I know it doesn't make you feel any better, but I just want you to know that we don't disrespect you in public. Only in private, I thought to myself. Please believe me, Cliff. Cody will never take your place. He's just a young guy that I still like to spend time with. He gives me something that you may not notice is missing. I will always give preference to you in everything and I never intended to hurt you. I couldn't keep hiding it from you. Being with Cody is just a small favor that you have to let me do. Her casual attitude made me burn with anger. Is he just a funny guy? A favor? Is she giving him something I'll never miss? 
My face was flushed with anger, and my eyes flashed at her. I tried to verbally lash out at her, but all I got was, you pathetic, selfish, insidious. I burst out in anger, unable to contain myself. Without thinking, I screamed, you're a liar, you heartless bastard. How could you do this to me? She listened to my outburst and calmly replied, I guess I deserve it. Unable to take it anymore, I abruptly stood up, causing my chair to fall. I ran out of the room, leaving the forgotten coffee behind. Where are you going, Cliff? cried Amy, begging me to stay. I need time to think about it, I snapped back. Give me a few minutes and I'll be back. I jumped out the back door when she whispered, All right, my love. My face was flushed, and I was breathing heavily as I stomped along the spacious terrace behind our house. The realization hit me like a brick. She was cheating on me. The disrespect she showed me made me boil with anger. I banged on the railing angrily before I tried to pull myself together. I was usually known as a balanced and controlled person, and this trait has served me well in my career as an accountant. But today, after hearing my wife lie about her affair, I had a hard time keeping my composure. I have repeatedly found that my calm and collected approach to dealing with anxious clients has a calming effect on them and helps them find solutions to their financial problems. But in this case, everything was different because the situation turned out to be very close to home. I was stunned by the revelation of my wife, with whom I have lived for more than 20 years, that she was having an affair with a younger colleague. I couldn't believe it. I had met this guy before at a school event and thought he was just her friend. Amy introduced him as her friendly friend, and I foolishly took her word for it. But now, having learned the truth, disturbing thoughts were swarming in my head. I took a few deep breaths, trying to calm down. I needed to think completely adequately, and this was impossible if I was in a depressed state. If I had stormed into the kitchen and yelled at her, it would only have escalated the situation and escalated into a violent quarrel. Although swearing can bring temporary relief, in the end it will only do harm. Besides, shouting and screaming has never been my favorite way of communicating. It became clear to me that shouting and swearing at Amy would only lead to my stubborn wife resisting even more. It's not going to help me find a solution that will make her stop. Instead, I needed to approach this issue with a clear mind and use all my rational thinking skills. I had to channel my inner accountant personality and focus on gathering information about her cheating in order to objectively analyze the situation. It took me another 10 minutes to calm down and regain control of my emotions before I could start thinking correctly again. When I returned to the house, I ran into an unfaithful wife. Amy was sitting at the kitchen table, nervously fiddling with her coffee cup. When she saw me, a worried expression appeared on her face. When she started to speak, I raised my hand to stop her. Wait a second, let's start over, I said calmly. I never expected this, Amy. I'm completely stunned and upset right now. She tried to calm me down by saying, Oh, Cliff, you don't have to be like that. I raised my hand again and interrupted her. Wait, what are you going to do next? Do you expect me to just forgive and forget? I asked, disbelief in my voice. You were dating someone at work without my knowledge and I should just brush it off? Amy looked worried when she answered. Not really. I knew you'd be upset and I can't blame you. I just wanted to be honest about what's going on. I didn't want to keep you in the dark anymore. Disappointed, I couldn't help but let out an expletive before I could stop myself. What did that sly guy say when you told him you were going to tell me everything? Well, he thought about it. That is, we both thought about it. It's better this way, Cliff. Is that what he said? Not really. Cody, despite your beliefs, is not a villain. He sincerely regrets our deceptive actions. We're both sorry. Seriously? Yes. He doesn't want to jeopardize our marriage, and neither do I. I was about to talk to her about ending the affair, but she messed it up. With a determined expression on her face, she sighed. Now that you're aware of the situation, I still want to keep seeing him. Not too often, only from time to time, and always outside of school hours. I was shocked by the audacity of this woman. Grinning, I nodded in agreement. 
We both sat in silence, staring at each other intently. After a while my wife sighed with a pained expression on her face. I'm sorry darling I know it's hard for you but he's a good man. We have a connection and we enjoy spending time together. I admit I have feelings for him but it won't affect our relationship in any way. Are you serious? Yes, seriously. Meeting him won't change anything in our relationship. This has been the case so far, and I will try not to do so in the future. I understand that you disagree, but he was a good friend to me. It may not be clear to you now, but I think he was also useful for our marriage. Really? You must be crazy. Please try to think rationally, Cliff. Have you noticed how much happier and more positive I've become lately? Do you remember last year when you accused me of having a hard time, right? Yes, I admit that it was. We fought, our marriage was strained, and our personal life became boring. When I first started spending time with him, we hit a dead end. What a coincidence. I guess he's also a marriage counselor. She waved away my sarcasm. Since we became friends, Cody has helped me change my worldview. I'm grateful to him for that, and I know you are too. I think we've become more than just friends now. I don't need to see him often, just from time to time when you're busy. I believe we can work this out, Cliff. I love you. I want to grow old with you. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You want to be with him forever. Is that what you're telling me? It was hard for me to accept the idea that you were continuing the affair. So you're not going to stop it, I stated. You expect me to be comfortable with you sleeping with him? She assured me that it would all end eventually. We may be getting along now, but he's much younger than me. We belong to different generations, and we have different interests. Cody and I could never have a long-term, committed relationship like the one we have. Our mutual feelings for each other will fade over time, but not now. You're crazy if you think otherwise, Cliff. Please believe me when I say that nothing will change between us. She patted my wrist condescendingly, assuring me that she was still the same loving wife I had always known. Our relationship will continue as before, she promised. Despite her assurances, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. It was only when she pointed out our increased sexual activity recently that I realized the true reason for this. When we first started dating, Amy and I were passionate and close. But when our children grew up and began to demand more time and attention from us, our love life naturally faded into the background. Even after they left for college, we still couldn't get the old spark back. I've never seen this as a problem, assuming that most couples our age experience a similar decline in their intimate lives. With a new understanding, I came to the conclusion that Amy was right when she said that we had managed to get our relationship back on the right track. I couldn't help but feel happy that we were now close several times a week, if not more often. It was reminiscent of the level of intimacy we shared when our children were still young. When Amy asked if I had noticed any negative effects on our intimate life while she was infatuated with Cody, I had to admit that I hadn't. Without waiting for my answer, she confidently stated, Of course not. I have to admit that we have a very active personal life for people our age, and I enjoy it as much as you do. I'm always there for you when you need me. I know that we both love each other. When I'm with you, I never think about Cody. He's just a small part of my life. We had a strong 20-year marriage and I want to keep it, she said with delight in her eyes. I'm not going to stay married to a cheater. She didn't appreciate my comment. Her expression went from sympathetic to hard. I'm not a cheater, she replied. She stated firmly, pursing her lips tightly. I'm surprised that you insult me so much. This is the first time I've cheated on you. And just so you know, I've never been with a man who wasn't dear to me. Do you have feelings for him? I exclaimed, feeling a mixture of anger and resentment. How do I know that you haven't replaced me with someone younger? Are you just keeping me around as a backup plan? It's not like that at all, Cliff, she insisted. You are my husband, and I love you, darling. I will never leave you. From time to time, I feel like I want Cody's company. It's not a constant desire, and it's not something I want forever. 
Only until this strange impulse dissipates. All I ask is a short period to satisfy this desire, which will not affect our relationship. It hasn't caused any problems in the last few months, so why bother now? While my forgetful wife was chatting, I was trying to figure out how she could believe that our dynamic wouldn't change. Knowing about her infidelity has already changed everything. I couldn't stop my mind from worrying about what she and that bastard were doing every time she wasn't home. Eventually I came back to reality and listened to her trying to justify her affair. It's going to be better for us in the end, Cliff, she insisted. I've been feeling more relaxed and positive lately, and I have more adventures in the bedroom. You must have noticed how much our sex life has improved. I've never refused to make love to you, and I'm not going to do it. I even let you try some of the things you've been wanting to do for a long time. She laughed, but I couldn't get rid of the feeling of betrayal and resentment. Since Cody and I have been together, I feel more comfortable exploring my intimate life. I no longer have any doubts about the variety in bed or new sensations. I'm sure you've noticed the changes, Cliff. Amy is right. Our intimate life has definitely become more adventurous. Although I was happy with the way things were before, I couldn't help but feel jealous of the newfound passion in our relationship. Amy is a wonderful partner, and our intimate life has always been satisfying, but I can't deny that I'm intrigued by the changes Cody has made in her. I couldn't ignore the fact that Amy had become more sexually active in recent months. At first, I attributed this to the absence of children or hormonal changes with age. Maybe I've become a better lover. But I later discovered that the real reason for her newfound passion was an affair with a young man from school. The irony was that she thought that revealing the truth would delight me, but in fact I felt depressed. I always thought I was lucky to have married her. When we first met, Amy was an attractive divorced woman, older than me, with two young children. Despite the age difference, we immediately found a common language. It was her second marriage and my first, but we got along great. I was fascinated by her charm and intelligence. My colleagues teased me for having an older wife, but I cherished her and her children, never doubting my love for them. Her ex-husband was irresponsible and abandoned them shortly after the birth of their second child. When we tied the knot, I adopted her children and raised them as my own, although biologically they did not belong to me. I was the only father they ever knew. Our children have grown into wonderful young people and I can't be proud of them. But after two decades of a happy marriage, she suddenly drops this bomb on me. Say something, Cliff, she begged, looking for a reaction on my face. I can see that you're upset and maybe you're feeling hurt. I don't want that. I want to make it as painless as possible for you. I know that you still care about me and you have your own needs. Let me help you deal with this, my love. You will always be my priority. With a sly smile, she stood up, came over to me and offered her support. She moved her hips in a way that I usually admired. Don't worry about anything. I'm here for you. Tell me what you need, honey. I'm sure we can figure something out. When she tried to sit on my lap, I pushed her away. She looked offended, but she didn't argue. Suddenly I got up and ran out of the room without warning. It took her by surprise, and she barely had time to say something as I was already outside the door and sitting in the car. As I drove away, I saw her standing in the doorway, covering her face with her hands. Feeling the need to escape before making a regrettable decision, I left the house and, as it seemed to me, drove in a circle for an eternity. I came up with the idea to drown my sorrows in alcohol, and fortunately, there was a small local bar on the next corner. I parked at the entrance, went inside and ordered a beer to clear my head. I decided to gather all the information I needed to make a future decision. To return home with a newfound purpose, I opened the door and saw Amy talking on the phone, looking surprised and whispering something urgently and then abruptly ending the conversation. Despite the tension in the air, I remained calm and resolute, remembering the advice of the wise bartender. I returned to my seat, and the cup of cold coffee was still in front of me. Amy was sitting across from me, her expression serious. 
Cliff, she started the conversation, but I interrupted her. Wait, let me speak first. I may not want to hear this, but I need to know how your affair started. Maybe this will help me come to terms with it, I said gloomily. So, how long, Amy? How long have you been breaking our wedding vows? Amy sighed, realizing that I was getting straight to the point. Not too long, she admitted. We've been friends for a long time. It was only a few months ago that everything turned into physical form. She confessed to me that his words made her feel special and helped her explore her intimate feelings. Talking about herself, she took a deep breath and seemed relieved that she had finally come clean. So, what are we going to do next? I asked. You just admitted that you lied and cheated on me for several months. How do you think I feel? My wife's infidelity with a much younger man, not much older than our own children, went unnoticed by me. Do you expect me to applaud your falsehood? No. When she reached across the table and took my hand, I couldn't help but feel the tension. Despite my devastation, my love for her remained as strong as ever. Please try to understand. I am overwhelmed with shame that I deceived you, she confessed. I hate that I disappointed you. I know you didn't know about Cody because our relationship remained secret. I never wanted you to find out about us. I was tormented by shame and fear that you would find out. Every time I returned home after meeting him, I was overwhelmed with guilt, and I promised myself that this would never happen again. Cody was incredibly understanding of my situation and never pushed me to continue. He respected my boundaries and was pleased that we only saw each other occasionally. We were both adamant that we didn't want to jeopardize my marriage, but it seems that everything has changed now. When she squeezed my hand tightly, watching my reaction, I couldn't help but realize that no matter how badly I behaved, my love for you remained unchanged. Cody is a good person and will make someone very happy one day, but he will never be able to replace you. Despite my repeated reminders that we are only friends with privileges, he always agreed. He claimed that he cared about me, but at the same time expressed the same feelings. As long as we kept our relationship a secret at work, we could continue our physical relationship without anyone knowing about it. But if we completely avoided each other in front of our colleagues, it would raise suspicions that I didn't want to deal with. So we continued to have lunch together occasionally to keep up appearances. We never made it clear that there was anything more than friendship between us, even when Heidi and other teachers joined us. I was sure that no one suspected our secret affair. You were a very cunning liar, I said. I lost control of myself for a moment. Amy gave me a sad look and silently agreed with me. Outwardly, I seemed like a smart, loyal wife with a successful teaching career, lots of friends, and a strong traditional marriage. But deep down, I knew it was all just a facade. The problem I couldn't get rid of was my guilt. I have always been proud to be a truthful and devoted spouse. At the same time, my actions contradicted this belief. Over time, I began to despise myself for betraying you, my beloved. I value our marriage above all else. It has always been my top priority. My relationship with Cody, on the other hand, was only temporary. Although I care about him, my feelings for him pale in comparison to what I feel for you. As a result, I began to feel guilty for my unscrupulousness, which made me pessimistic about my life. I no longer recognized myself and did not love the person I had become. The obvious solution would be to stop cheating, but I'm not sure I can do that at the moment. Amy frankly confessed, I would just like to break off the relationship with Cody so that everything between us would be as before, but I doubt very much that this will happen. Why do you think that? I replied, unable to help myself. You said yourself how good we are together. We raised two wonderful children and overcame many difficulties in our marriage. We both had successful careers and built a life together. Now that Martha and Robbie have left for college, we finally have the opportunity to enjoy our time together like never before. If you really love me as much as you claim, 
then returning to the role of my faithful wife and giving up this temptation should not be a problem for you. She sighed heavily and gave me a worried look. Maybe that was the case at first, but now I'm not sure. I really love you immensely, but recently I discovered another side of life and realized my own desires. I'm not sure I can just go back to my old life, even if I want to. I've tried to stay the affectionate wife I've always been to you, but talking to Cody showed me a different perspective and opened my eyes to new opportunities. I pulled my hand out of hers, feeling a surge of irritation. I tried to keep my composure, but I couldn't help myself. Are there any other options? I snapped back. You can't stand up to him, can you? You're too involved with him. I've been supporting you and your children for years, and now all of a sudden, I'm not good enough because some young stud caught your attention? She shook her head. No, Cliff, it's not like that at all. You've always been the best husband and father I could ever dream of. After so many years of living together, we have both changed. It's just a natural progression of a long marriage. I stared at her, feeling my temper rise. I don't want to hurt you, Cliff, she said softly. I really don't want to. I know you may not believe me right now, but nothing will change between us. We will always be together. Although I sympathize with your emotions, I am happy with my current life. I have a loving husband, two respected children, and a male friend who brings excitement and joy to my life. This friend makes me feel emotions that I haven't felt since I was a teenager. I hope you can understand and support me in this decision. Muttering trash under my breath, I wondered if she had heard me, but she didn't say anything. As she continued to talk, she assured me that she would always be there for me and that I could always count on her. However, she herself wanted everything to be the same for a while longer, until she finished exploring these new sensations. Then, she was going to break up with Cody and become exclusively mine again. This cheater asked for time to come to her senses and hoped that I would understand and appreciate her frankness. Promising to make amends if I gave him such freedom, she assured me that I would not need anything. I will always be a faithful wife, keeping the time of my communication with Cody a secret. Just support me on this one issue, and I will show you my gratitude for the rest of our days. Damn it. This conversation was getting more complicated by the second. When she confessed her affair, I was completely taken aback. We chatted happily over dinner and now I felt like a devoted husband. My previously loving wife now had a younger lover, undoubtedly more energetic than me. It took me a while to collect my thoughts. I wasn't up to it. I hoped to reason with her and put an end to the affair, but it was clear that she had no intention of stopping. She just needed my cooperation to keep exploring her feelings. This was the height of deceptive behavior. Months of lying and cheating, and I didn't suspect anything. Now that everything was known, I had to face the harsh reality. You promised me that you would keep me as your husband. But don't you understand what's wrong with that? Now that I know about the many lies you've told not only to me, but also to our children, friends, and everyone we know, how can I trust you again? How can I be sure that you won't change your mind? Perhaps because of Cody, or another attractive man you might meet in the future, and replace me with someone younger. Amy showed her disappointment by snorting, because deep down she knew I was right. Despite her protests, she has now been exposed as a liar. Nothing, she said, could be trusted. When she looked back at me, her eyes filled with tears, as if she wanted to argue with me, but deep down she knew that I was telling the truth. I would never do that, and you know it, she finally admitted. You're very irritable, she added. I replied bitterly, feeling entitled and arrogant, throwing her infidelity in her face. Why don't I just get rid of you? I don't need a cheating wife, and I never wanted a wife like that. I should just divorce you and move on. But if I was hoping that these harsh words would hurt her, then I was mistaken. Amy's expression softened and she looked at me with unexpected compassion. There was a new note in her tone when she spoke. I know it's hard for you right now, 
She replied trying not to sound smug. But a divorce? I don't think it's in your best interest, Cliff. I asked why, saying that at least I could keep my pride. The expression of her pity only fueled my anger. Divorce will hurt both of us, Cliff. You may not have to deal with my cheating anymore, but it will still be painful for you. She shrugged indifferently. I doubt you'd like the idea of a divorce. I don't think any of us will like it. She looked right at me. Speaking more sharply, she began by pointing out that we live in a state where there is no divorce due to the fault of the spouses. Most likely I will receive half of everything, including the house, savings and pension fund. Since you are the foster parent of Martha and Robbie, you will have to participate in their college education. In addition, I can receive alimony due to the significant difference in our income because I work as a teacher. The court will expect you to provide me with reasonable support. This could eventually result in a significant amount of money. I suppose she and her young lover have thought of everything. So, in case of divorce, you will take everything from me. She said it quite seriously. I really don't want that, she assured me. I would never want to hurt you. I want to continue living with you and loving you the same way as before. But if you leave me, there will be financial consequences. And I'll still be able to see Cody whenever I want, which, as I understand it, may be unpleasant for you. It will be better if we continue to live as before. We will stay married and enjoy our wonderful life together. I will still be your devoted wife and we can have intimate relations whenever you want. No one should know anything else. You will always be my number one. Then she added sympathetically, I really appreciate your understanding in this matter and will give you anything you wish. I just want to spend some time with Cody. Not much, but just a little bit. The rest of the time I will continue to make you happy. I was happy. Until you dropped that bomb on me, I replied bitterly. Now I realize that I was stupid enough to let my unfaithful wife and the man she works with take advantage of me. Cliff, it's not what you think. When I started to leave, she called out to me, begging me to stay and discuss everything. But I knew there was nothing more to discuss. You gave me an ultimatum, and now I have to decide if I'm ready to accept it. Despite her beliefs that nothing would change between us, she tearfully insisted that I focus only on the fact that she loves me and appreciates the freedom I gave her. I will do everything to make you happy. But you have to stop your affair right now, I said with a disappointed sigh. She lowered her eyes and whispered softly. I can't do that yet, honey. I can't stop right now. But it won't be for long. With finality in my voice, I replied. Then we have nothing more to talk about. This conversation is over. I've heard enough. You've made your feelings clear, and nothing I say will change that. But know this. I will never be able to trust a word you say again. I will no longer try to reason with a liar and a traitor. Feeling numb and exhausted, I retired to my office and thoughtlessly turned on the TV. The transmission made no difference, since his mind had not yet recovered from the collision. The idea flashed through my head to leave for the hotel without saying a word. But deep down I knew that this was not my style. I was too rational to act on impulse. Sitting and watching TV, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was trapped in a nightmare. How could she betray me like that? Several hours passed, and I was still in a daze, unable to comprehend the events that had just happened. At some point, I noticed my wife coming out of the kitchen. The sliding glass doors made a sound as she opened and closed them, stepping out onto the back terrace. I assumed that she needed privacy to make a phone call, perhaps to her lover, to inform him about our conversation. After a while, she returned and entered the office. I was sitting in an armchair so she couldn't sit right next to me, but she moved closer and watched me for a while. Are you okay, Cliff? She asked in a gentle tone. I know it's not easy for you, darling, and I want to help you. I caught a glimpse of her smiling at me strangely. Do you want to continue the conversation or go to sleep? What is it? She asked. I will do everything to help you feel better. I really want it. I felt disgusted. 
The fact that she offered to make love to soothe my mental pain was unpleasant. It was like making love to her husband just out of pity, most likely suggested by her boyfriend. The fact that she treated me like something secondary was infuriating. This whole situation has upset me. I decided to ignore her offer and went upstairs to bed. I was furious with my wife and briefly thought about spending the night in the guest room. But I quickly realized that she was wrong, so why should I leave our bedroom? I quickly undressed and got into bed, wanting to put the quarrel in the past. A few minutes later, Amy came into the room. When she saw that I was already in bed, she quietly went into our private bathroom and changed into a seductive nightgown, which she knew I liked. She turned off the light, slipped under the covers without a word, and began to approach me. But as she approached, I couldn't ignore the sinking feeling in my stomach. At that moment, I realized that she was sleeping with another man and trying to have intimacy with me. The thought made me feel unbearably disgusted. I turned away from her, hoping that she would understand my silent message. Instead, she moved closer, trying to squeeze me and reaching for my cheek to turn me towards her. I pushed her hand away, refusing her advances. Do you want to fool around, honey? She whispered softly, but an unsettling image of my wife, 51 years old and slim, in bed with Cody popped into my head. She smiled at him when he took what should have belonged only to me. Without moving, I took her hand away and firmly said, Never again. She tried to explain something, but I interrupted her, expressing my anger. I turned to face her, and she was stunned by my gaze. Even in the dark, I knew she could feel my bitterness. Of course I'm upset, I said sharply. I have just discovered that I have been a cuckold for several months now. If you really need sex, call Cody. I am sure your young stallion will be able to satisfy your treasonable desires. Amy was speechless and shocked by my revelation. She must have been surprised by my refusal. I took one look at her and turned to the wall. Amy was silent and didn't bother me anymore. I couldn't sleep that night, and I could see that she was trying to calm down too. The next day, I woke up before the alarm clock, still feeling bitter about our conversation. Amy was still in bed and awake. I took a quick shower, and when I came out, she had already left the room. Amy had to leave for school an hour before me, which didn't bother me much, since I always got up early. I used to often wake up before her and even cook breakfast, but everything changed after I found out that she was cheating on me with some young asshole. I dressed quickly and got ready for the day, no longer wanting to please her like before. When I came downstairs, I saw her in the kitchen, making breakfast for a change. Good morning, Cliff, she greeted me sweetly. Bacon and eggs and toast for you. Would you like some coffee, dear? Ignoring her attempts to behave normally, I left the house without saying a word. Despite her requests to wait, I got into the car and drove away, leaving her behind. At work, I tried to focus on my business, but thoughts of her and her lover constantly crept into my mind, making it difficult to concentrate. Amy tried to call me several times during the day, leaving messages on my voicemail. I preferred to ignore them, deleting each one without listening. After receiving some nice messages from her, I quickly looked through them and deleted them. Despite my attempts to get her out of my head, her constant texts and calls made it impossible. The mistakes I made at work only increased my stress, and in the end I decided to take a day off. In search of advice I turned to a lawyer for advice. The elderly gentleman listened to my concerns and confirmed what Amy had warned me about our possible divorce. It became clear that I would remain emotionally and financially exhausted, and she would most likely leave for a younger man. I will remain in a difficult position to support her financially. Having no other romantic prospects, I was faced with a harsh reality. I could find myself alone in a small apartment, experiencing financial difficulties. The thought of staying with her wasn't much better, since I would only get pathetic intimacy from her while she was having fun with someone else. It was obvious that this young man was satisfying her desires in a way that I would never be able to. At the age of 47, I realized that I would not be able to compete in the bedroom with a slender and attractive 30-year-old man. 
If I decided to stay married and turn a blind eye to her infidelity, it would be perceived by the court as condoning her infidelity. I would not be able to claim adultery as grounds for divorce. The thought of having to have an affair of my own in return was even more overwhelming. The idea of staying married and participating in an infidelity competition with his wife was a losing one. Many men were interested in her, some of them even as young as her own children. Cody was a prime example of that. At 51, Amy remains attractive thanks to her short dark hair, toned body and friendly demeanor. For comparison, I am an average elderly man with a thinning hairline and a few extra pounds. Despite a decent job and a normal appearance for a 47-year-old, I'm not sure that many women would be interested in an older, married, middle-class man like me. The difference in our dating prospects is depressing. She is still considered attractive, but I am not. This realization came hard to me after a long and frustrating day at work. For dinner, I went to the bar where I stayed as long as possible. The atmosphere seemed boring to me, and I would have preferred to be at home with my wife, have a beer and sit in front of the TV. Instead, I sat alone in a bar, surrounded by other lonely people, and drowned my sorrows in alcohol. When I finally got home, Amy was already in bed, seemingly not hoping for my return. After a restless night, I woke up quite early. At dawn, I left the house and headed to Denny's to have breakfast, and then aimlessly drive around the city and go through the many shops to pass the time. When I returned home, I wondered if my unfaithful wife or her lover was there. To my surprise, she was at home and greeted me with a smile. When she tried to kiss me, I turned my head and she kissed me on the cheek. I pulled away from her embrace and walked past her, clearly upset. To avoid her, I hid in the office. When I came out, she was in the kitchen. So I went to get a beer, and then I settled down in the living room to watch TV. Soon after, she appeared with a glass of wine. Do you mind if I join you? Amy asked politely. I couldn't help but notice that her outfit had changed. A tight t-shirt and tight shorts, and the scent of spicy perfume was in the air. Whatever you want, I replied. This time I was sitting on the couch. I moved to the side to offer her the remaining space. Despite the empty seat, she chose to sit next to me. While the TV show was on, Amy began to show signs of affection. I could tell that the wine was starting to have an effect on her, maybe even making her a little playful. She definitely wasn't drunk. When she bent down to my neck, I took the opportunity to justify myself and said, I need to go to the bathroom, Amy. Gently pushing her away, I got up and left the room. I noticed that she was looking at me strangely because I rarely ignored her attempts to get my attention. After finishing my business in the bathroom, I decided not to return to the living room and immediately went to the kitchen. Will you come back? She called out to me. This show is very good, but not now, I replied, deliberately lingering in the kitchen. As soon as I felt that enough time had passed, I took a beer and headed into the room, closing the door behind me. As expected, Amy soon opened the door and asked with a smile, What are you up to? There are a few things I need to catch up on. Don't you want to watch the show with me? It's probably better to abstain. I continued to work intently at the computer while she lingered nearby. I felt her disappointment when I didn't pay attention to her presence. I could tell she was puzzled. Despite the pleasant dinner we had just shared, she was probably hoping for a more relaxed atmosphere. A moment later, she put her hands on my shoulders and asked me what I was watching on the screen. I brought up some financial documents from a project I was working on, a complex spreadsheet that she probably wouldn't understand. I explained that I had been at work too long on Friday and had not had time to finish it. I assured her that skipping the show wouldn't upset me. She started gently massaging my neck, knowing that I liked it. Her touch was soothing and she made the massage as tempting as possible. Her hands moved along my neck, giving me pleasant pleasures. I could smell alcohol on her breath as she bent down to kiss the top of my head. I just waved her off, making it clear that I wasn't interested. It took her a while to figure it out, but eventually she walked away and returned to the living room. 
Could you close the door on the other side? I asked, to which she obediently complied with the request, and left. I breathed a sigh of relief. Even though Amy was my longtime partner, her attempts to seduce me still had an effect. She knew exactly what she was doing to cheer me up, but I was determined to resist her advances. I didn't want to share it with anyone else. It took several hours before I finished my work, and when I finally got into bed, I found her fast asleep in a revealing nightgown and matching panties. It was clear that she intended to lure me in, but she fell asleep from the wine before she could do anything. The next morning I woke up before Amy and spent the whole day ignoring her again. By Monday, the tension between us had become palpable, as I continued to resist her temptations. Her car wouldn't start, so I had to give her a ride to school. She asked me to pick her up after work as well. I received multiple calls from Amy's school throughout the day, but I preferred to ignore them, knowing that she was most likely trying to tell me that her boyfriend would give her a ride home. Deciding to surprise her, I left work early and arrived at school before the end of her last lesson. When the students left the classroom, I entered and greeted her in a cheerful tone, asking if she was ready to go home. But instead of being pleased, she gave me a stern look and asked why I wasn't answering her calls. I apologized, explaining that I had been busy all day. Then she said that she had already arranged a trip home. Unperturbed, I insisted that I was already there, so it was time for us to leave. At that moment, a fit guy with dark hair entered the room and confidently approached my wife, as if expecting her to greet him with a kiss. It was none other than her lover, Cody, whom I recognized immediately. I've seen him before, but I didn't pay much attention to him then. Now, standing a few feet away from me, he looked even younger than I remembered. Dressed in sneakers, shorts, and a t-shirt showing off his muscular arms and legs, he looked more like a student than a mature adult teacher. Even though he was an asshole, he certainly looked good and was in great shape, which made it obvious why Amy was infatuated with him. Amy's eyes widened as he approached, and Cody looked a little confused. Oh, Cody, she stammered. I just told him, Cliff, that I... I interrupted her by finishing her sentence. I kept calm, knowing there was a chance he would be there. He seemed surprised to see me and recognized me with an annoying smile, glancing between me and my wife. Oh, hi, he said, holding out his hand. I'm Cody Bakerfield. I ignored his gesture and replied dispassionately, Yes, I know who you are. To diffuse the tension, Amy spoke up. Cody, this is my husband, Kreef. You've probably run into him before. The young man's embarrassed expression softened when he remembered me. Oh, right. Cliff Wilson, I remember you. I'm glad to see you again, he said. I have no doubt. I remember meeting you at a parent's party a few months ago. Amy speaks very highly of you, he added. I guess it's not high enough, I replied, casting a sharp glance at my wife, who looked tense. Amy, let's go. It stinks in here, I said wrinkling my nose as if the smell was unbearable. While she was packing her things, Cody turned to me. Excuse me for a moment, Mr. Wilson. May I call you Cliff? I frowned and waved away his question. What do you want? I snapped. Just a minute of your time, Cliff, Cody said. I understand that there is some tension between us, but it shouldn't be like this. I know that Amy told you about our friendship. So what? I replied. I just want to make it clear that I don't dislike you at all and respect your strong bond with your wife, Cody explained. Is that why you're having an affair with her? I asked you, I replied. My wife's sharp, worried sigh echoed through the room. Cody nodded understandingly. Yes, it's true, he began. Amy and I are close friends and we had intimate moments together. But that doesn't mean that we don't appreciate your relationship with her. We both have no intention of harming your marriage or family. We can only be friends, nothing more. Amy has always made it clear that she loves and is devoted to you. As Cody continued to talk, I couldn't help but think, this guy is smart. But he continued with a smile on his face. I hope you can understand and not be upset about my friendship with Amy. 
She had a positive impact on everyone, including me. With the development of our relationship, we realized that we had to talk to you before entering into an intimate relationship. I take full responsibility for this mistake. Amy has always behaved appropriately, and only I have allowed events to go further than they should. I admit I was infatuated with her, and I lacked self-control. I am sorry for my inappropriate behavior, but please know that I had no ill intentions towards you. In fact, I am grateful that you allowed her to work here, as she has a positive impact on children. Her friendship is priceless to me, and I will always cherish it. The situation was difficult, and I was confused. I shifted my gaze from the absurd conversation to my wife, who seemed charmed by his outwardly respectful demeanor. Her eyes sparkled with admiration, as if she was struck by the words of her young admirer. If I asked you to end your intimate relationship with her, what would you say? He just shrugged and replied. I understand what you're getting at. If I were you, I would probably feel the same way. But the decision to end our friendship will ultimately be hers. You praised Amy's intelligence and passion, saying that you would respect her wish if she decided not to date you anymore. On the other hand, you admitted that you would not be able to resist if she wanted to continue dating you. Despite his frankness, I couldn't bring myself to completely abandon her. I admired his honesty, but at the same time despised him for it. In the end, it became clear that if I didn't take drastic measures, he would continue his relationship with my wife, regardless of whether I approved of it or not. I turned away and saw Amy and this man exchanging glances. I couldn't stand the adoring expression on her face. She was old enough to be his mother, but in his presence, she looked like a teenager in love, infatuated with her teacher. It was obvious that I no longer held the same place in Amy's heart as her new boyfriend. His smooth speech left me feeling completely defeated. I thought about confronting him, but I knew I wouldn't stand a chance in a fight. When I went outside and didn't look back, I heard my wife and Cody whispering behind me. She followed me out, hurriedly calling my name. Her high heels clicked loudly on the floor as I quickened my pace to break away from her. After the conversation, I felt vulnerable and helpless, especially knowing how much Amy admired him. I couldn't help but envy his charm and how easily he charmed my wife. Despite my anger at him, I was more upset about her. The ride home passed in silence. Amy said a few words of comfort, but mostly stared out the window in silence. Reflecting on the strange incident in class, she couldn't help but wonder what her lover's opinion of her was now. It is likely that he made an even greater impression on her than before. On the other hand, she couldn't help but feel that her own reputation had suffered. Compared to his confident demeanor and flattering words about her and her wife, she looked weak and insecure. When I returned home, I felt a heaviness in my legs when she went up to the bedroom, feeling much older than her real age, 47 years old. Amy noticed my depressed mood and tried to comfort me, but it didn't help much. She offered to pat me on the back and something else to help me fall asleep, but I wasn't interested in her touching me. She smiled sadly, got into her nightgown and settled down next to me in bed. The next night, I moved my things to the guest room, much to Amy's disappointment. She begged me to stay, insisting that as her husband I should be by her side. She even promised to fulfill any of my intimate desires if I stayed with her overnight. Despite her attempts to convince me, I refused to be persuaded and eventually went to sleep on a small bed in the guest room. That night, Amy went to bed crying. The week passed quickly. Work, dinner, bed. We had a heated argument in which she denied all the reasons for my leaving the dormitory, calling me a child and saying that I could come back as soon as I came to my senses. I stood my ground, and from that moment on, we no longer shared a bed. Amy was constantly ahead of me at home because my work hours were longer than hers. She cooked the food, and we ate in silence. Our weekends passed without incident. On Friday and Saturday, we spent evenings at home watching TV. After that, we went to our rooms for the night. I wasn't sure if she was still dating Cody. She never confirmed or denied it, but I had a feeling it was true. 
Even if I came home on time, she had plenty of opportunities to be with him after school. Since he lived near their school, it was likely that they spent time together. Despite her attempts to hide their affair from me, I did not stay away. Watching her beaming expression when he walked into her classroom, it was obvious that he was getting more attention from her than I ever had. Amy knew about my depression. She remained friendly and expressed her willingness to resume our relationship if I wanted to. In the evenings, she dressed provocatively and asked if I needed her help. She gave me encouraging looks. We tried to maintain positive and easy conversations. A few days after a tense meeting in her class, I returned home feeling drained and depressed. As I drove up to the house, I noticed Amy's car next to another car that I didn't recognize. Going inside, I found Amy and another woman relaxing on the terrace in swimsuits, sipping wine under the rays of the setting sun. They did not sunbathe, but rather rested in the shade, radiating a sense of relaxation. Amy heard me enter and got up from her seat going inside. Her friend stayed outside. Hi Cliff, she greeted me with a smile. I'm glad you're back. She tried to kiss me, but as always, I turned away. Baby, she cooed, hugging me. Hard day? What is it? She asked. I shook my head. Not really. That's good, she replied. Why don't you change into something more comfortable and meet my friend Susan in the backyard? Amy took me outside and introduced me to Susan. Cliff, this is Susan. Amy introduced the woman. I've only known her for a short time, but she's a good friend of mine and really wanted to meet you, Cliff. The woman stood up and held out her hand to me. Hi, Cliff, she greeted with a warm smile. Nice to meet you, Susan, I replied, returning her firm handshake. Susan was a petite and vivacious woman with short blonde hair and a slender figure. Despite her slight excess weight, she had a beautiful face, and the swimsuit clung tightly to her curves. According to my estimates, Susan was about 40 years old. Both women were beautiful and sophisticated, the kind that men usually find attractive. After talking for about an hour, Amy decided to order Chinese takeaway. As soon as the food arrived, we all gathered in the kitchen to eat. The women enjoyed the wine, and as the evening went on, they laughed more and more. Knowing that today is Friday, I realized that they don't have to worry about going to school or work in the morning. As the evening dragged on, I began to feel a little tired. The women were still enjoying the wine and looked quite intoxicated. I had only drunk three bottles of beer, so I was far from intoxicated. Susan and I shared funny stories, and laughter filled the room. When I mentioned that I was going to sleep, they seemed surprised. Is it time for bed already? Susan was joking. It's not even 11 o'clock yet, honey. He's probably getting old, Amy teased. Their laughter echoed, but I didn't join in. After years of loneliness, Amy's joke struck a chord. Sensing my annoyance, she reached out and patted my hand. Good night, I grumbled, getting up and leaving. That night I had a vivid dream about a woman. It seemed so real to me that I woke up. Confused, I looked down and saw the blonde's head on my lap. When my brain cleared, I realized that Amy was lying next to me. I was shocked and didn't know how to react. I sat up abruptly and pushed the woman off my lap and then jumped out of bed, feeling incredibly disoriented. The room was still dark while I was trying to collect my thoughts. To my surprise, both Amy and Susan were lying naked on the bed and smiling at me. What the hell are you doing? I exclaimed in shock. We were just trying to make you feel good, honey, Amy said softly. I thought you'd like it, Susan added, holding out her hand. Go back to bed and let us finish what we started. You'll like it. Please, Cliff, Amy pleaded softly. I know you told me, but it's been too long. I just want you to be happy, honey. Let us take care of you, please. Anger and confusion overwhelmed me. How dare they manipulate me while I was sleeping and defenseless. Susan may not have realized how sensitive a topic our intimate life is, but Amy certainly did. Furious, I stormed out of the room and headed down the stairs to the kitchen. 
Taking a moment to spray water on my face and chase the drowsiness out of my eyes, I turned around and saw both women standing in the doorway. They were watching me closely and looked a little embarrassed, sitting at the kitchen table in their dressing gowns. What were you thinking about? I asked sharply, prompting an anxious look between them. Amy replied softly, We just want to help you. Susan added, I learned about your situation from Amy and thought I could help you get out of this crisis. I still believe that I can if you let me. I don't need help and I don't have a recession, I snapped, pointing accusingly at my wife. Everything was fine until she met this man and decided to cheat on me. She promised that nothing would change between us, but look at what we have now. She's been cheating on me for months now, and I've had enough. Susan intervened. I don't condone her behavior, but she's an adult woman and she makes her own choices. I replied, she made that clear, and now we're in this mess. I know she doesn't intend to hurt you, Cliff, Susan said. That's easy for you to say, I replied. Isn't it painful to realize that my wife is not satisfied with me? She has to engage in intimacy with a guy half her age in order to feel complete. And how do you think I feel? Amy clearly enjoys talking to her young lover. She's so happy that she can't stop sleeping with him. In fact, she told me that I should accept this and accept her behavior. Amy looked uncomfortable when I brought it up. But this isn't the first time I've expressed my feelings. Perhaps Susan is just hearing this for the first time. She gave my wife a knowing look, clearly understanding the situation. Then she turned to me and said, I didn't mean anything bad, honey. We just thought it would be interesting for you to try something different with both of us. I thought you'd like it. Most men like it. I couldn't take it anymore. I yelled at her, expressing my disgust at her infidelity. I despise cheaters and she knew it. Instead of ending the affair as she should have, she tried to pressure me into cheating too. And when I refused, they both tried to manipulate me while I was sleeping. It was a disgusting act, even for someone like Amy. Susan looked contrite, and Amy avoided my gaze looking at the floor. I just want to see you happy, my wife muttered, her voice breaking. Without hesitation, I suggested the idea of inviting another woman into our bed. I knew you weren't interested in me anymore. Susan is attractive and wanted to join us. I thought it might be nice. But forget about it, I snapped. What's your next plan? Drugging me and making me go crazy? Come on, Cliff. What we did wasn't that terrible. Really? Well, I have a suggestion. Why don't you and Susan invite Cody over? I'm sure this jerk will gladly take the opportunity to engage in intimate activity with a couple of beauties like you. And since you like it so much, maybe I'll get in touch with some sick guys I know. You could have a wild sex party, isn't it fun? Amy snapped irritably. Please stop, Cliff. I understand that we screwed up, but there is no need to spread your hands like that and show disrespect. So I'm crazy now? I said, leaving the room. You both disgust me. Maybe I should go to the hotel? I wasn't going to let my stupid wife kick me out of my own house. I went into the guest room, locked the door, and put a chest of drawers in front of it. If they had tried to get inside, at least I would have heard them coming and been able to protect myself. The next day, I reached my limit. During my lunch break, I went to a lawyer and instructed him to handle the divorce. When I told him that my wife and her friend were planning to ambush me while I was sleeping, he offered to get a restraining order to remove her from the house and keep her at a distance. I agreed. He told me how she was trying to lure me into a situation comparable to hers in order to claim moral superiority. A few days later, Amy received a public lawsuit in the school cafeteria. The procedural server boldly entered the teacher's lounge and delivered the legal documents in front of her comrades. After that, he handed Cody, who was known for his disrespectful behavior, a claim for alienation of affection. He then went to the principal's office and handed him a letter for allowing Amy and Cody to have an inappropriate relationship during school hours and on school grounds. There was no concrete evidence in the last charge. We planned to gather witnesses from the gym class to confirm the story Amy told me, but hoped that part was omitted. 
I suspected that some of the teachers knew about Cody's affair with my wife. Only time will tell. Anyway, they were both unfaithful, and I suffered because of it. The call interrupted my work after lunch. Damn you, Cliff! Amy shouted. You're a fool! I warned you about what could happen in a divorce! There can be nothing worse than living with a liar and a criminal. I'm fed up with you and your despicable boyfriend. You can both go to hell. I understand why you're mad at me, she said. You've made that clear many times. But did you really have to involve Cody in your revenge? He's a good guy. This accusation in his record could seriously damage his career. No luck. He should have thought about it before having an affair with a colleague. He's a scumbag like you, and he deserves any consequences. Also, please don't bring any of your friends into the house anymore. And you'd better stay away too. You can look at the restraining order I put on you. I need you to stay away from me. I changed all the locks so that you wouldn't bring your girlfriends and put pressure on me anymore. You're crazy, I exclaimed. It was different for her. Most men would love the opportunity to have two attractive women in bed, but not you. I guess two overconfident women is too much for a man like you. Susan was right. You were an inferior person. By the way, is your friend Susan married? If so, she's just as bad as you are. I want to talk to her husband and tell him which person he is married to. Please get your stuff out of the driveway before it gets damaged by the rain. If you need anything else, contact my lawyer. She started talking before I finished the conversation. That evening, Amy came with her friend Heidi to pick up her clothes. I watched from the window as she drove up to the house, shouting curses and waving me away. I just grinned. I felt a huge weight lifted off my shoulders when she finally left home. Her reckless behavior no longer occupied my thoughts. The children contacted me several times. Martha was upset to learn about her mother's act and asked if I could forgive her and give her another chance. I told her bluntly that her mother wasn't worth it. On the other hand, Robbie was very understanding and sympathetic to his mother's mistakes. He didn't hold me responsible for asking her to leave, and I was grateful for his support. I assured them both that I still love them, despite the current situation. I was always there for them when they needed help. Our relationship is still strong. Unfortunately, my lawsuit against the school board has not been continued. It seems that Amy was telling the truth about not having an intimate relationship on school grounds. She and her boyfriend only did it in his apartment or other places so that their affair would remain hidden. Despite our attempts to find evidence of their misconduct at school, Cody still lost his job. He was severely reprimanded and then released, which forced him to quickly move to a new place of residence due to the spread of gossip. Amy also faced dismissal and held her bitterness, blaming me for her problems at work and heated phone conversations. Despite the fact that she applied to a school in another area, they found out about her affair, which led to a refusal. Martha informed me that she had found a job as a secretary at a real estate firm in a nearby town. The divorce process dragged on, and eventually we had to sell the house because neither Amy nor I could manage it on our own. Maybe I could have handled it, but it was too hard for me. When Amy left, she took only a few things from our house. I rented a two-bedroom apartment near my work and temporarily stored most of our furniture. You may wonder why it took me so long to divorce her. Let me clarify. During the months that we lived together, I gradually emptied our shared accounts without her knowledge, as she was busy with her novel. After the divorce, I didn't go on dates very often. I was hesitant to trust women again, and finances were limited due to the cost of children's education and Amy's alimony payments. Despite the fact that I couldn't hide much from Amy's lawyer, once I was alone with myself, I focused on spending very little and saw how my financial situation improved. Having immersed myself in my work, I am now on the way to a promotion in my company. After the ordeal with my wife, I am cautious about a new long-term relationship and do not dare to immediately resume acquaintance. But with the help of caring friends, I met several pretty girls. Despite the uncertainty about the future, I am satisfied that I can enjoy life without a permanent relationship. In the future, I'm going to find a life partner with a nice woman.
One Friday, I was dating an attractive woman I met at work. Her name is Stacy, she's almost 30, and she's been divorced for a couple of years. A sweet, funny, and pretty woman. We had a third date, and then we were on the other side of town and enjoyed dinner at a nice restaurant. We were sipping our coffee and enjoying dessert, and then I noticed an elderly woman I knew a few tables away. This woman was terribly thin. My ex-wife with short blonde hair was having dinner with an older man who looked frail and had gray hair. He looked to be in his 70s. At first I didn't recognize her, but upon closer inspection I realized that it was Amy. I told my date, Stacy, that my ex was nearby. She looked around and seemed surprised. Is this woman your ex-wife? Stacy said cheerfully. She looks more like your mother than your wife. I explained that she was a few years older than me, to be precise. When we broke up, I couldn't help but think that she must be having a hard time right now. I couldn't help but notice how she had lost weight, seemed almost too skinny. Stacy chuckled, noting that she looked old enough to be my wife, while I looked like her son. It was hard to believe that she had once been my wife. Despite the fact that I tried to maintain a facade of indifference, deep down, I was worried about Amy. She was wearing a sleeveless dress that exposed her arms with loose skin hanging from the bones. The wrinkles on her face that appeared when we were together became even more noticeable. I decided not to tell Stacy that she looked unwell, hoping that she would take care of herself. After we finished our meal at the restaurant, we no longer raised the issue of her well-being. When we left, Stacy wanted to go to the bathroom, so I waited for her at the entrance. Suddenly, I felt a touch on my shoulder and heard a familiar voice. Hi, Cliff. Turning around, I saw Amy standing there. Her face had aged a lot, and I could barely recognize her. At first, I planned to compliment her appearance, but decided to be honest instead. I greeted her, saying I was glad to see her, and asked how she was feeling. She replied that she was not feeling very bad. Her bright blue eyes lost their luster, and her face lost weight and acquired a pale, unhealthy color, which worried me. I mentioned that I sometimes talk to Martha and Robbie, noting that they seem to be doing well with their studies. She confirmed that Martha visits her sometimes, but Robbie doesn't come so often. We stared at each other in silence for a while. Well, Amy, I don't want to interrupt your plans, I said, breaking the silence. He's not really my date, she replied vaguely. Oh, so you're still with Cody? I asked innocently. A haunted look appeared in her dull blue eyes, and she lowered her head briefly before answering, No, Cody and I are no longer together. Her voice was hoarse as she continued. I haven't seen him since a few months after our divorce. Amy looked up at me and added softly, But that's okay. I don't want to see him anyway. I'm sorry to hear that. There was an awkward silence, and I felt the need to end the conversation before Stacy returned. It was good to see you again, Amy. I was glad to see you too, she said, meeting my gaze. Suddenly, her slender fingers gripped my hand tightly. You know, Cliff, I'm really sorry that everything ended between us. You were right about everything. Cody wasn't worth it. I understand that now, she said, her voice full of emotion. There were tears in her eyes as she asked, Are you married? I noticed your companion. She is very beautiful. No, I'm not married, I replied. You know, as they say, I bit once. I was shy twice, I added, trying to lighten the mood with a joke. But she didn't laugh, but looked at me with a feeling of sadness in her eyes. Yes, I understand you, dear. You've always been the only one for me. I knew it back then, but I was too stupid to figure it out, she admitted. I was confused and felt a little awkward. Well, I do not know what to say, I stuttered. Listen, Cliff, if you ever need to talk about this, I'd be happy to meet you. Putting a crumpled piece of paper in my hand, she looked at me expectantly. Her old face was lined with lines of emotion. I accepted the paper without hesitation, and at that moment I saw a glimmer of the light that once shone in her bright blue eyes when our love was strong. I really want to hear from you, Cliff, she whispered softly. 
I know that we can never be together, and I know that I've ruined everything, but I hope that now you have found happiness, even if not with me. Your new companion is really beautiful, and I hope she understands how lucky she is to have you. With that, Amy turned away and headed for her table, leaving me to ponder the weight of her unspoken regrets. After talking to the old man, she cast a curious glance in my direction. At that moment, Stacy came out of the bathroom. Are you ready to go, Cliff? She asked. Absolutely, I replied, and we walked out of the restaurant, holding hands. When I left, I threw a piece of paper in the trash. I didn't know that this would be the last time I saw Amy. Later, I learned from her children that she had moved in with an elderly man in a neighboring town, most likely the same one with whom I had seen her in a restaurant. Unfortunately, her health was deteriorating as she struggled with diabetes. Although Stacy and I have never tied the knot, I am doing well in my career as an accountant. I try to spend time with my children whenever possible, even though I no longer see their mother. Despite the feelings I still have for her, I can't forget the pain she caused me, and I don't want to come to terms with it. A year later, Martha told me that Amy was in a terrible condition in the hospital and asked me to visit her. I didn't want to see Amy, and I honestly admitted it in March. Even after much persuasion, she couldn't convince me otherwise. Martha said that her mother wanted to hear words of forgiveness from me. She wanted me to forgive her, but it was not so. I love her and hate her at the same time. She ruined everything by her own actions, and I want her to know this for the rest of her days. I understood that perhaps she would go to the next world without receiving my forgiveness, but this would be a punishment for her. After graduating from high school, having no direction in life, I decided to join the army. I didn't become a Navy SEAL or a Ranger because my physique didn't quite meet the requirements. At 5 feet 9 inches tall and weighing 150 pounds, the Army assigned me to the role of a ray rack clerk. Four years have passed. When my military service was coming to an end, I found myself at a crossroads, not knowing what to do next. It was then that the woman who eventually became Mrs. John Carpenter entered my life. We crossed paths in San Diego at the annual Overline Tournament on Fiesta Island in Mission Bay. Throughout the competition, I stole glances at Barb, but I didn't dare approach her, being sure that she was too cool for me. With a height of 5 feet 8 inches, blonde hair, a stunning face, and a body that attracts glances in a bikini, I couldn't help feeling that she would never be interested in someone like me. I couldn't believe what I could offer a woman like her. But to my surprise, that day Barbie came up to me with a smile on her face. Hi, my name is Barbara, she said. I've noticed that you've been staring at me all day so you should at least know my name. It seemed that fate was on my side, as we immediately became friends. By the time my performance ended, we were married. The only problem was that I still didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Barb wanted me to go to college and get a degree in accounting to become a financial controller. She dreamed of a typical suburban soccer mom lifestyle, which seemed impossible if I continued delivering pizza. Personally, I wasn't thrilled with the prospect. After many years of working as an accountant, the idea that I would work in this field for the rest of my life did not excite me. I considered myself more of a handyman, able to work with my hands and preferring to work outdoors. But the idea of becoming a construction contractor seemed to me too risky and unstable to maintain the desired lifestyle of Barb. I couldn't shake the feeling that working as a financial controller meant something like mediocre or unsatisfactory achievements, but I struggled to come up with a better alternative. When I decided to go to college to pursue a career as a financial controller, I flashed 10 years ahead. I successfully obtained a financial controller's license, but for various reasons I was dissatisfied with my profession. Despite this, my wife was happy, and as they say, a happy wife is a happy life. We bought a house shortly after I got my license, and we had two wonderful children while I was still in college. In general, life turned out well, 
because my wife Barb devoted most of her time to housekeeping and taking care of the children. She constantly made small improvements to the house, did landscaping and so on. I often took on difficult assignments on weekends. I worked more than full time, but it wasn't unbearable. Most nights I had a delicious Barb dinner waiting for me, and two or three times a week it was followed by passionate lovemaking. What really made our lives enjoyable was the occasional joint entertainment. I especially enjoyed our vacations together, and the end of spring was the highlight after taxes. Every year at this time, Barb spent a week with her close sister, who lived far away from us, and every year I took a week off and went fishing. Have I told you how much I love fishing? They say that even the worst day on the water is better than the best day at the office, and I can't disagree with that. I strive to replenish our freezer with a large catch, but most of the time I just want to relax and enjoy the peace and quiet. No distractions, no screens, no interference, just me, nature, and the soothing beauty of nature. This is my escape, my chance to regain my strength and find much-needed peace. When the past finally caught up with the present, Barb and her sister decided to go on a spring cruise, a tradition they had been following for many years. Their children were left with their aging mother Barb, who had health and financial problems in retirement. On the second day of vacation Sunday, an email arrived from Carl, a friend from the army, and in an instant, everything changed. Hi John, I have a dilemma and I decided to come to you. I'm on a cruise with my partner right now and I noticed a woman who looks strikingly like your Barb. I've only seen the photos of her that you shared, so I can't be sure. I've attached some photos so you can take a look at them. I trust you so much that I know if it's really Barb, you won't approve of her actions. I am looking forward to your reply, hoping that you will confirm that it is not her. And if that's the case, please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Watching what was happening, I was speechless. While I was sitting in a calm environment, surrounded by beauty and silence, an uneasy thought did not leave me. I couldn't help but realize that if men can arouse interest in a woman to satisfy their desires, then women are able to create a whole relationship. This is a harsh truth that often blinds us men, and we remain in the dark until it's too late. It is said that the husband is always the last to know about this. And it is the woman's ability to deceive, even to simulate emotions and intimacy that allows her to commit this betrayal. And so I look at the photos of my wife and our life, now in the arms of another man. They danced elegantly. She was wearing a stunning split dress, and this image burned in my mind. He was wearing a tuxedo and hugging her passionately. His hand caressed her neck as they shared a deep kiss. In the background sat her sister who was always kind to me, and watched what was happening with a smile on her face. Another photo, taken from an unusual angle under the table, captured them at a nearby table, involved in another kiss. This time his hand slipped imperceptibly but unmistakably under her dress. I sat in shock, unable to take my eyes off the photos until my phone ran out of charge. Even after he turned off, I couldn't get the vivid images out of my head, the coolness of the evening air brought me out of my stupor, confirming what Carl had been saying all along. My marriage was over. Of course, I had a comfortable life, but I refused to sacrifice my integrity in order to preserve it. I didn't want to settle for leftovers when I deserved more. The only thing that made our relationship special was my wife. But now I realized that she was never really mine. The uniqueness of our relationship was not only in my contribution, but also in the mutual devotion that we shared. The idea of choosing each other above all else is what made our bond special in my eyes. It was not just about physical intimacy or fleeting moments of pleasure, but about a deep, meaningful connection that went beyond superficial desires. I couldn't help but feel disappointed at the prospect of sacrificing everything for a woman who could easily leave me. With two children to take care of, and a spouse staying at home, I felt like I was being taken advantage of. Not only had she already destroyed my world and left me with a broken heart, now she also wanted to use me financially. 
I found myself at a crossroads, torn between my love for her and the harsh reality of my situation. But one thing was clear. I refused to settle for a relationship based on anything less than sincere love and mutual respect. So now I have to be a servant for the rest of my life? According to one judge, a husband in a marriage like mine should just accept that he will pay alimony indefinitely. What kind of justice is this? She cheats, and I end up paying for it both by her actions and by the judicial system. But I refuse to be a victim in this situation. I'm not going to put up with this. I understand how important it is to take care of children and their well-being, but that's enough. It's time to stand up for yourself. In my opinion, it is not useful for children to watch the betrayal and destruction of a loving husband and see how the culprit receives a reward from the system. This can negatively affect their moral development. In addition, it may be harmful for children to demonstrate their mother's intimate relationship with a new partner before the divorce is finalized. That evening, I decided to leave and return home. Upon arrival, I sent Carl a message thanking him for his true friendship. I contacted him, asking for additional photos and any information about the lover, and a few days later asked for help. If Barb decided to end her fate, then I decided to end mine in a different way, perhaps even more painfully. Fortunately, I hadn't worked for a week, so I didn't have to worry about taking time off. On Monday, I came to the HR department and quit. I only stayed on it for Barbie, but now that reason is gone. I was finally free. Thank God I was finally free. After I contacted the bank to settle and close our shared accounts, Barb started using her own account to cover her expenses, as I did mine. This state of affairs did not cause me any problems. But when Barb returned, she found that she had been billed for the last trip, and she was unable to pay it. The house we owned together was valued at $400,000, with a remaining mortgage of $350,000. I decided to put the house up for sale at the price of Tricot $30,000, but with some reservations. In the middle of the morning, I went to the bank to deposit $20,000 to pay off the mortgage. The rest of the day and evening were spent looking for a woman who could pass for Barb. Fortunately, I found someone who was willing to help, without asking any questions, for a reward of $2,000. I gave her a prepaid cell phone and told her to get rid of it after we were done to keep her anonymous. I didn't know her name or address, so I just addressed her as Barb. Garbage collection was the next day. I spent several hours late at night loading trash cans with Barb's stuff and putting furniture up for sale at a very low price on Craigslist. The next morning, I watched the scavengers take away almost everything that was important to my wife cosmetics, clothes, childhood memories. On Tuesday, I refused to insure our car and took out a new minimum policy with another company only for my car. In the evening I took out my anger on Barb's car, making it unusable and in fact useless. By Wednesday morning, all furniture and appliances had been removed from the house, with the exception of children's things, which I put in a warehouse. I spent the rest of the day with a friend who looked like Barb, dealing with legal issues. I drew up a contract for the transfer of the house exclusively in my name, and, together with a friend who looked like Barb, went to the notary to arrange all the papers. Since Barb usually leaves her driver's license at home when she goes on cruises and carries only her passport with her, we used her driver's license to notarize our identities. A thumbprint was also required to change the owner of the house. Don't worry. The doppelganger dipped his finger in pineapple juice for two days so that most of the print disappeared. Then the remaining print was changed. If she had been asked, we could have just said that she had been in an accident. But it turned out not to be so important. It was the middle of the night, the lighting was poor, and the notary barely looked at her. She just wanted to go home. Ten days later, the doppelganger's fingerprints would be back to normal, and no one would be able to prove that it was her. The house was sold on Thursday, and the insurance was cancelled on Friday morning. The new owner paid off the bank, and ownership passed to him. It's amazing how quickly you can sell a house if it's for sale at $70,000 below the market price. 
Theoretically, Barb could cancel the deal, but it would be expensive and ultimately useless. After sending Carl the divorce papers on Thursday evening, I flew to Las Vegas and spent money rampantly on Friday evening. When Carl sent me photos of Barbie with her lover during the filing process, I couldn't help but chuckle. Photos can really be priceless, can't they? He even captured Barb's sister in the frame, who looks completely shocked. It looks like Barb and Studley's last romantic night didn't go as planned. What a shame. I returned home on Saturday morning, making final adjustments and looking forward to Barb's arrival at noon. When Barb arrived home, she was furious because I didn't pick her up, and her cell phone wasn't working because I turned it off. Not to mention that I ruined her little rendezvous by showing up. But her mood quickly changed when she saw the condition of the house. Once upon a time, the beautiful landscaping was destroyed, and in its place was dirt. The house itself was in disrepair. I destroyed everything. The wallpaper was stripped, the walls were covered with graffiti, and the bedroom was completely destroyed. Only the walls remained. Barb felt like she was about to faint at the sight of all this. In total, the renovation of the house will cost about 20,000 rubles. When she asked me what happened, I suggested that maybe she should give an explanation. She looked puzzled and mentioned my sudden decision to divorce her when she was visiting her sister, hinting that I was crazy. When she approached the house, she found a large sign with the inscription, Cheating on a Walking Wife, with a photo of Barb, whose lover's hand got under her dress. Barb's reaction to this inscription was instantaneous. She felt sick. It's amazing how stupid women can be sometimes, isn't it? When she threw up, she turned to me and asked accusingly, Did you do that? Do you hate me that much? How do you think I should have reacted when I found out that you were cheating on me? I calmly replied, Hate is not the right word. Rather, a mixture of disgust and contempt. When I got to my new car, an old beat-up pickup truck, I threw Barb the key to the storage room. I coldly informed her that the house was sold, all her belongings were gone, and she had violated the boundaries of the site. I pointed to the no trespassing sign and drove away, leaving her in tears on the side of the road, watched by curious neighbors. A week later, the new buyer had already renovated the house and put it up for sale again, completely unaware of the drama that had played out. A few weeks later, my lawyer and I met with Barb and her lawyer for the first time. It took Barb two weeks to find a lawyer, because every time a potential lawyer called me to discuss payment, he informed me that as far as he knew, Barb and I had no property, and we were unemployed. Therefore, paying for legal services can be a problem. Naturally, before going to Vegas, I had already paid the lawyer a fixed fee for his services. The contract stated that the fee was considered received as soon as Barb was officially served with a subpoena. As it turned out, Barb was unable to hire a lawyer for her credit card because on Friday, I contacted her company and informed them of our impending divorce, lack of work and assets to cover any credit card expenses. It is likely that after such a statement, her card was immediately closed. Nevertheless, Barb managed to get legal representation through the free legal aid service. And although it wasn't the best lawyer, legal assistance still covered my expenses. It took two weeks before we finally met face to face, and it was quite an interesting scene. Barb's lawyer wasted no time in inundating me with testimony notices, interrogations, and demands for financial documents. I couldn't help laughing. He would be very disappointed with what he would find. After Barb's lawyer spent a lot of time trying to get me to disclose financial details, including filing a motion for coercion, I eventually admitted that we had about $50,000 before the situation changed for the worse. I allocated $20,000 to the bank, $10,000 to pay our joint bills, and $5,000 to my lawyer. I claimed that I spent the rest of the money in Las Vegas, although in fact I lost only $8,000 and I saved the remaining $5,000 for the future. I kept the $2,000 I paid Barb's doppelganger a secret. Instead, I generously gave all the dealers $100 each and took pictures with them, as well as with several working girls, to give credibility to my story. 
my unforgettable trip to Vegas will stay with me forever. While Barb was away for a week, I devoted part of my time to looking for a job and found a gold mine. I found the perfect job with Stephanie, a kind, divorced woman my age with two wonderful children. She had a ranch, and she needed someone reliable, a permanent handyman and an assistant on the ranch. This is exactly what I like to do. I was offered room and board in exchange for 30 hours of work per week. There was no catch for Barb. If Stephanie had an extra job for me and I decided to take it on, I would be paid $100 for an extra 10 hours a week. But the decisive factor for me was that I would live in a cozy two-bedroom guest house, where my children could also live. Such an agreement was beneficial to both sides. After all, our children were about the same age. Throughout the trial, Barb tried to make peace with me, using hackneyed phrases that only irritated me even more. I found out that the lover was actually her high school sweetheart, who left her for a rich girl after seeing the possibility of a comfortable life. Despite the small possibility of resuming our relationship, it seemed unlikely that we would ever be able to be together again. After learning that Barb really enjoyed an intimate life with this man, and that she continued a school romance with her lover, she finally destroyed all hopes of reconciliation. The thought of who might be the father of our children terrified me, but fortunately Barb had a conscience when it came to children. I thought about getting back at her lover, but in the end it was Barb who got mad the most. I made sure to send copies of the photos to his wife, who apparently forced him to wear a tool cage as a condition of preserving the marriage. It was pretty funny and I couldn't have expected a better revenge. This, of course, put an end to Barb and her affair. The trial that followed was nothing short of hysterical. Despite the judge's best efforts, nothing was achieved in the end. The judge, clearly in favor of the mother, tried her best to award her custody, but the chances were slim. She warned me about the possibility of going to prison for various reasons, but my lawyer reminded her that I was prepared for such consequences. But if she had brought it to an end, I would have lost my job, and my children would have had a stable life in which they could be near their mother. This would lead to a losing situation for all participants. Barb and the kids couldn't rely on social security alone, and the best job she could find was only $9 an hour. With such an income, she barely managed to find someone willing to rent a more spacious house. Three of them needed more expensive housing, and the judge tried to oblige me to give Barb money from my weekly earnings of $100. I explained that due to my health and age, I could not work extra to compensate for this. Actually, Stephanie was quietly giving me extra money, but it was our little secret. As a result, Barb had to pay child support, which infuriated the judge. She had a sunburn on her face that almost made me burst out laughing. The house was quickly sold after it was put up for sale again. Unfortunately, no lawyer wanted to file a lawsuit against me or my buyer on conditional grounds, and Barb was out of luck. Even though I lost $35,000 on the house, I would have preferred it to burn down, and Barb and her lover used it as a love nest while I continued to make payments. As a result, when everything was settled, Barb continued to work in an undesirable mode. I lived in a small studio, took the bus to my job for $9 an hour, and paid alimony. I cherished my children and enjoyed working for a boss who was attractive and supportive. My children thrived living on the ranch with Stephanie's children, and every day the four of them took the bus to school, which gave me the opportunity to be alone with Stephanie. I didn't realize that my job had an unexpected plus. Using my past experience, I was able to help Stephanie save on taxes. This act of kindness brought us closer together, and soon we realized that we were exactly who we were looking for in each other. We complement each other perfectly. I may still feel too exhausted to work 40 hours a week, but now it's happening for a completely different reason. But I'm not complaining. Someone may criticize me for my actions towards Barb, but in my opinion, she brought this upon herself. I've moved on to a happier life with a wonderful woman, and I'm getting better. Now life is really wonderful. Since my children and I moved out of the guest house and started renting it out, our finances have grown noticeably. 
Thanks to the extra money, we were able to buy a new sports car in Stephanie's name. Last week, I saw Barb waiting for her bus in the rain, honked at her and waved. It felt like revenge, but I forgave Barb and realized that she had done me a favor. Now I live doing what I love, with a woman I completely trust. Now life is really good. Vanessa and I have been happily married for 25 years. Our twin boys are now in their first year at a prestigious private college. I have always believed that I have a successful business and a loving family, and I am ready to work tirelessly for them. Although they never directly expressed their gratitude, I assumed they were grateful. It took me a while to realize that, like my faith in Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy, my idea of their appreciation was also a fantasy. I had been running my own advertising agency for about five or six years when I first met Vanessa, my future wife. She was a young woman who worked as a waitress in a seedy bar. Despite her less-than-ideal surroundings, she was undeniably attractive, with long brown hair and a great figure, but she was barely 21 years old. I definitely wasn't looking for a moral and monogamous partner for the night, and she seemed to sense it. Leaning closer, she subtly pushed her breasts together, hoping to get more tips, and at the same time looked at my cheap, fake Rolex watches, mistaking them for much more expensive copies. I hid the truth about the cost of the watch from her because I was smitten by her beauty and wanted to impress her. Her modest outfit hinted at her background, and she noted that I was the richest guy she had ever dated. Despite the fact that we had been dating for only six months, we quickly tied the knot. Looking back, I realize it was hasty, but I've been craving companionship ever since my ex-girlfriend left me for her guru, taking my money with her. It's time to come clean. Vanessa was only the second girl I had an intimate relationship with, but she completely shocked me romantically. She introduced me to new sensations in the bedroom that I hadn't even thought about, despite my vivid imagination. I never asked about her past lovers, because I knew that her talents were not drawn from books. It was because of her bedroom prowess that I was eager to marry her as soon as possible. Thanks to my stable income, we were able to save enough money for our future children's college education. We lived in a beautiful house, drove nice cars, and had regular vacations. She might not be the smartest woman in the neighborhood, but I thought she was the most passionate lover in town. She was adored, cherished, and cherished like my beloved wife. She treasured the luxury that I provided for her in our luxurious lifestyle. But that all changed six months ago when my biggest client went bankrupt leaving me with an impressive debt. Instead of sinking into despair, I took action. Two days a week I began to devote to actively searching for new business opportunities, going out on the streets. Unfortunately, due to financial difficulties, I had to fire all three of my employees. This meant that I had to take on not only their workload, but also my own, which led to long days of working 10 hours a day, 7 days a week. Despite all the financial difficulties of the company, my former employees were angry with me. At first, my wife supported me in increasing the amount of work, but after a month, she began to get upset because of the current situation. She complained that I was constantly working and neglecting my family, paying attention only to business. I tried to explain that I am also concerned about financial responsibilities, such as mortgages and groceries. But she didn't seem to understand. It became clear to me that she was living in a fantasy world when she casually asked if she could buy a new Mercedes because her current car is four years old and her friend has a newer car with all the latest features. She thought she deserved the same. At first, I was speechless and just stared at her in disbelief. If you really want a new car, you can find a job to pay for it. You can also participate in paying household bills to ease your husband's burden. She accused me of meanness, stinginess, and cruelty, expressing dissatisfaction with the fact that she had a limited choice of work due to her past experience as a waitress. She asked why she had to work when none of her friends did. She blamed me for our financial situation, saying that if I were a better husband and businessman, 
we wouldn't be in such a predicament. After that conversation, our physical intimacy stopped. She was frowning and no longer smiling. Our kids were furious when I told them I couldn't keep paying over $100,000 a year for college tuition. I suggested they transfer to a public college and take out a student loan to cover the costs. When I mentioned that they could also find a job, they insulted me by calling me a loser and a mediocre person whom they now despise. Their reaction to me selling their Mustang convertible to cover expenses was so extreme that the Civil War seemed like a peaceful gathering to them. Then I realized that for them, I was just an ATM. I didn't just take second place in their hearts. I didn't even participate in the competition. I've never felt so isolated, abandoned, and unloved in my life. I couldn't drown my sadness in alcohol. I had to stay sober and keep moving forward. But for what? And for whom? I was constantly exhausted, lost weight, and was frankly not myself. A lot of new gray hair and wrinkles appeared on my face. When I returned home from work, my wife was nowhere to be found. She returned around 11 p.m. without explaining where she had been. I hugged her, more to determine if she smelled like another man than out of affection, but the distance between us seemed insurmountable. The smell of cigarette smoke hung around her. If I had extra money, I would consider hiring a private investigator or renting a car to keep an eye on her. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford either because I didn't have any money at all. After a week of uncertainty, she finally admitted that she works as a waitress in a trendy restaurant in the evening hours. I felt an instant rush of happiness and inspiration. I quickly explained to her that our financial situation was dire, and her earnings would be a much-needed lifeline for our family expenses. She burst out laughing. While my money was considered common, her money went exclusively to her own needs. After months of not being able to afford new clothes, she finally went to the mall on Saturday and bought an evening dress and matching shoes for her first paycheck. She was happy to show me her new outfit, but I was upset when I discovered that she was wearing a black garter belt and corset underneath. Are you a professional? I asked sarcastically, but she just ignored me. That evening, she planned to go with a friend after work and return only late at night. As she was leaving, I noticed a new expensive watch on her wrist. A car horn sounded on the street, and when I asked about the watch, she didn't answer anything. Instead, she hurried to her colleague's car and drove away. I don't like to sit back and prefer to be prepared for anything. I changed into a suit and parked the car outside the restaurant when it was already closing. Her best friend lived in the West. The woman I called the Wicked Witch of the West arrived at the restaurant and my wife hurried out into the pouring rain in her new outfit to join her. They left together, and their presence haunted me for years. This woman, who was divorced twice, did not have a positive effect on my wife. She had three children from three different men. One of her ex-husbands even claimed that she engaged in questionable activities to supplement her income as an interior designer, acted as a call girl and organized similar events for her friends. I wasn't sure if these statements were true. They went to their destination, leaving me behind. I entered a bar known for its reputation as a place where scammers gather, which was attached to the motel. Peering through the rain-soaked window, I watched as my wife was introduced to several men, each of whom bought her a drink. I was secretly photographing this scene until a rich man in a fancy Porsche showed up. He kissed my wife cunningly handed her the money, and then appeared in front of her. They began to dance a slow dance, and despite his lack of good looks, he cheekily squeezed her buttocks. He wasn't particularly tall or muscular, but exuded wealth with his expensive outfit and flashy sports car. It was obvious that the main attraction for my wife was his money, which she discreetly hid in her bra. They settled down at the bar, drank a few glasses, and he casually ran his hand over her thigh, hidden under a garter belt, and began to caress her skin. Despite the burning desire to challenge him, I restrained myself, needing additional evidence of their illicit relationship. Furious, I sat in the car and watched them leave the bar and head to the next motel room, which overlooked the parking lot. When he unlocked the door, 
I quietly crept up behind them, determined to get to the truth. I approached him unnoticed because of the heavy rain, pulled out my trouser belt and wrapped it tightly around my neck. One more step towards my wife and I'll kill you, I threatened. He nodded, visibly scared and wetting his pants. How much did you pay for it? I demanded. When he stopped talking, I tightened my belt, forcing him to admit that he had paid $500. I let go of the belt and he quickly ran away. In his haste, he burned the rubber on his Porsche by reversing into a parked car and denting its passenger door. He continued to drive without stopping, and this decision turned out to be wise in the end. Everything is not as it seems, my wife said, and this statement did not come as a shock to her. Then what's the matter? I asked, getting no answer. I let go of her hand and reached for her bra to get $250. When I counted the money, it dawned on me that my wife's loyalty was solely due to my financial situation. As soon as the money stopped coming in, so did her loyalty. It was then that I finally admitted the truth that I had been avoiding all this time. When we first met, she told me that her part-time job was what she did for a living. My heart broke when I realized that she had never really loved me. I was just a means to an end. I couldn't bring myself to confront my crying wife, so I silently headed to the bar where Anne was. Without saying a word, I warned her to stay away from my wife or face the consequences. When I left the bar and hurried to my car, my thoughts were consumed with anger and betrayal. My wife tried to get in the car, but she couldn't open the passenger door, and I drove off without her. Although at first, I wanted to leave her to her fate. Our financial situation did not allow us to take a taxi home, so I reluctantly allowed her to get into the car on the condition that she would not talk to me. The next day, I decided to file for divorce, giving her the opportunity to seek financial support from other men. Despite her pleas for forgiveness, I was not moved by her despair. Suddenly changing her attitude, she began to insult me, calling me a loser and expressing a desire to get rid of me in order to find a man who can provide for her. She boasted that she would take everything from me in the divorce, not realizing that I had been experiencing financial difficulties for several months. She wasn't very smart. On Monday, I decided to close the business. I'm tired of working so hard for my ungrateful family. I used the remaining money in the business account to cover the costs of filing for bankruptcy and divorce. Since I couldn't afford a lawyer and there was no need to divide the property, I relied on my industry connections to find another job, even if it wouldn't pay as well as the previous one. I decided to hold off on finding a job until the divorce so as not to lose most of my salary on alimony. Instead, I contacted the crime squad and provided them with information about the escort business at the Tully Home Hotel and Bar, including several photos. A few weeks later, a report appeared in the newspapers about a raid involving three women. I threatened to kill her if I found her at Tully Howe again, and even mentioned that I had photos of her in a motel room with Mr. Portia. In fact, there were no such photos, but she didn't know about it. Despite my anger at her, I could not accept the idea that she would be sent to prison, especially since she is the mother of our two children. I realized that I also didn't want to face the awkwardness that might arise from my wife's arrest. Sitting across from her well-dressed lawyer, I felt out of place in a torn hoodie and jeans from Temple University. He demanded a house, alimony in the amount of $5,000 a month, half of the business and legal fees. I laughed at his demands especially when he pointed out my income on tax forms for the last three years, saying that I could quite afford it, since my wife had no obvious source of income. My wife angrily threw my 25-year-old fake Rolex watch on the table in front of me, saying that they were as worthless as me. In response, I sarcastically pushed several documents to her lawyer. Among them were the stubs of my unemployment checks for $500 a week, which were still four weeks away. There was also a letter from the franchisee's tax office about the closure of my business and a copy of my bankruptcy application. I showed him my almost empty checking account and a letter from the bank saying that they had accepted a deed of gift for my house instead of foreclosing on it due to a six-month mortgage delay. I gestured to my future ex-wife 
explaining that she earns $250 a night as an escort at the Tully Home Hotel, and that I want to receive 30% of this income. This information has not been disclosed before. Her lawyer raised his voice in exasperation. Then I took out about $2 in coins from my pocket, divided them in half and handed one pack to the lawyer. Will this cover your fee? I asked. The lawyer turned to his client, considering the offer. You assured me that he has money. I don't do anything for free. You can expect my bill by the end of the week. You have the means to pay for it. With that, he got up from his seat and angrily left the luxurious mahogany and leather conference room. Before leaving, he reached across the table and took four quarters. I took out my imitation Rolex from where she had thrown it and put it back on my wrist. The clock continued to tick accurately, signaling that it was time for me to leave. My wife was sobbing and screaming, What should I do now? Maybe you decide to extend your career as a waitress in a room, earning $250 a night, despite the fact that you are getting old and losing your attractiveness. But I'm sticking to the same position as Clark Gable in Gone with the Wind. To be honest, I don't give a damn about your decision. 